environmental activism for, oh gosh, at least five years now, speak up. Um, and green energy is a topic that's been really important to us because in trying to find effective solutions, a really genuine response to the environmental crisis, uh, green energy has come up as an obstacle. And we've talked about it always on the side, we've never really come at it head on. And so we thought for this year, for Peel, it's something we should do. So we're probably gonna talk for about maybe 40 minutes and then we'll do a little Q&A and we'll call it a day. So I'm gonna to Max. Right, thanks. Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming. It's an honor to be here again. Uh, so today we're going to introduce you to some ideas that you probably will be familiar with already as environmentalists, but we might also be talking about some things that are surprising or even shocking to some of you. So first of all, we're going to introduce you to the world of industrial production. And uh, this is a world that's completely hidden from most of us in our everyday lives. Almost no one understands how industrial production happens. Uh, but today we're sort of going to lift back that veil and try and examine what's going on behind the scenes. Can y'all, y'all want me to stand up in the back? Is it? No. Yes. Okay. Yes. I don't usually like to stand up, so it might be a little awkward. But. So second, we're going to take that information about industrial production and we're going to apply it to, uh, to green technology. And for the purposes of this talk, I came up with a term for green technology, which I thought was somewhat appropriate, which is the great green hope. And I think that that uh, describes the relationship that many environmentalists have with green technology. So thirdly, we're going to talk about the implications of this focus on green technology, uh, very serious implications, people putting all their faith into this as a solution to the problems we face. And then if we, might have if we have time, we might get around to just talking about <coughs> solutions, which is obviously a huge, a huge subject. So obviously we're starting with false solutions. So hopefully we'll get around to some real solutions. So the space bar doesn't work. Arrow doesn't work. Okay, <laughs> okay. okay. there we go. So we're going to start by looking at industrial production. And this is just a highly simplified chart that I put together to illustrate the process of producing something in an industrial manner. So this is looking specifically at some sort of green technology like a solar panel or a, a hybrid vehicle. And it, this is going to look a little bit different depending on what industry specifically you're examining. But uh, for the purpose of this talk, we're going to e examine the materials required for um, a wind turbine. This is a 1.5 megawatt wind turbine manufactured by General Electric. It's one of the most commonly used wind turbine designs on the planet, and I think there are over 20,000 of these specific units installed around the world in use right now today. Uh, so the nacelle of the turbine is the portion up in the top here. Uh, that weighs 56. Thirty-six tons. So we're talking about a very large piece of equipment. But this particular model is pretty small by modern standards. There are turbines around today that can be three times taller and use eight times as much materials. But we're going to use this particular wind turbine, this model, as a gateway for our exploration today. So what are these materials? According to General Electric's figures, one of these turbines is about 60% steel, so it requires around 100 tons of this material. 35% uh, of the weight of the generator is copper, uh, which is about 15 tons in this specific model. This wind turbine also requires around 700 pounds of neodymium. Neodymium is a rare earth metal uh, that's used in many technologies from hard drives to cell phones to these sort of things. Uh, so let's focus on these three materials, steel, copper, and neodymium. You can't have a wind turbine without these materials or without replacements that are very similar. So not many people think about these materials. How boring is steel, right? I mean, this, these, I don't know, these chairs might be made of steel. They might be aluminum or something else. I don't really know anything about chairs, but it's all around <laughs> us. It's all around us. Our cars are made of it. This building is made of it. There are girders in here that are made of steel. 
but we never think about it. So tonight we're going to do a little basic education on steel and these other materials. Where do they come from? So let's get into it. This is where iron ore, which is the raw precursor to steel, comes from. This is the Carajas mine, which is the largest iron ore mine on the planet. It's located in northern Brazil in the heart of the Amazon rainforest. And the environmental impacts of the mine, as you might guess from that picture, are enormous. First and foremost, to reach the ore, they obviously have to clear cut the rainforest. They also clear cut more forest for waste piles, storage facilities, transportation facilities, roads, rail lines, etc. It's another image of the mine. The statistics right now are that they cut down more than 4,000 square miles of rainforest around this mine every year. That's an area bigger than Chicago. Another impact of this specific mine is that mercury contaminates 90% of the fish downstream of this area. In addition to the environmental impacts, iron ore mines in the Amazon have displaced tens of thousands of indigenous people. They've decimated newly contacted indigenous tribes through the spread of infectious diseases. And they've flooded these remote areas with thousands of workers, networks of roads, and all the associated impacts in terms of uh, poaching, logging, economic and sexual exploitation, etc. So, moving on to copper. This is a copper mine, one of the largest copper mines in the world. I chose to show you this one because I live in Salt Lake City, Utah. And this is about 10 miles from my house. This particular mine is called the Bingham Canyon Mine. It's owned by Rio Tinto, and it's the largest man-made excavation in the world visible from space with the naked eye. To give you a sense of scale, I'd come up maybe to about the hubcap on that truck right there. And that's the truck in the mine. So, basically what you're looking at here is a mountaintop removal mine. There are two mountains missing there. We're used to hearing about mountaintop removal coal mining, but I don't hear very much about mountaintop removal copper mining and I think we need to be just as outraged. It's another image of the mine. The impacts of copper mining mirror that of steel production. It's strip mining. We're talking about land clearance, soil erosion, toxic tailings, air pollution from the vehicles and the machinery, huge releases of dust, uh, mercury and other heavy metal contamination, habitat loss, soil and groundwater contamination, greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera, et cetera. So from beginning to end, it's just a nightmare. And another example of how toxic it is, that's Salt Lake Valley. The worst air quality in the United States. Worse than LA, worse than New York City. And the number one source of pollution in the valley is the copper mine. So, on to neodymium. Is this starting to look familiar? <laughs> How long will it take us to see the pattern? This is the largest rare earth mine in the world. This supplies about 50% of the world demand for rare earths. It's located in China. The problems with rare earth mining are exactly the same as the previous two. We're talking about toxic tailings, massive pollution, water pollution, habitat destruction. And in China, of course, you can add slavery. China supplies 95% of the rare earth minerals that are used in cell phones, hybrid vehicles, wind turbines, and other advanced technologies, advanced technologies. And the reason I talk about slavery specifically is because a substantial portion of the Chinese workforce, uh, especially for these dirty jobs that are likely to result in cancer and other issues, uh, the workforce comes from Tibet. And what happens there is the military forcibly disbands communities and sends them to these labor camps. Uh, to, to dig coal mines, uranium mines, and rare earth mines like this. Uh, so at this point, one-fifth of the Tibetan population has died in mines like this. That's 1.2 million people and counting. This is absolutely heartbreaking. This is a letter that a woman from Oregon, actually, found inside her plastic Halloween decorations that she got from Kmart. And I'm not sure if you can read it, but it says, uh, if you occasionally buy this product, please send this letter to the World Human Rights Organization. 
thousands of people here were under the persecution of the Chinese Communist Party will thank and remember you forever. This product produced by Unit 8, Department 2, some labor camp uh, in China that I can't pronounce, I'm sorry. So, uh, the letter goes on to explain the grueling long hours that they work, the verbal and physical abuse that they face, the torture that is done to the inmates of these labor camps. So this is where the consumer goods of the West come from, and I think many of us know this already, but we don't know that this is also where green technology comes from. So, this is a rare earth smelting, or a, a group of rare earth smelting facilities in China. The story is the same throughout the entire process of refining these metals, uh, fabricating them into the sheets and pipes and fixtures and magnets and all the things that are needed to assemble these green technologies. It's the same when the turbines are installed, uh, which requires pouring thousands and thousands of pounds of concrete into huge foundations. It's the same throughout the whole process. You've got heavy industry, habitat destruction, toxic chemicals, poisoned water, exploitation of the community, uh, greenhouse gas disaster, greenhouse gases, public health issues, uh, etc. So just between concrete and steel, we're talking about 10% of greenhouse gas emissions globally. So these are massive industries. So from beginning to end, the process that results in that <coughs> requires environmental devastation on a huge scale. And the story is the same from electric cars to solar panels and beyond. So this gets it about right. Signs of insanity. Dig up non-renewable metals, ship them around the world, transform them, all it green and sustainable. <laughs> Pretty well said. So this is the critical point. There is no way to produce industrial technology without industrial devastation. Green technology requires global trade, global exploitation, global destruction of the land, the air, the water. You just can't do it any other way. It's impossible. And it just goes on and on. So this uh, is the new Ivanpah solar thermal power plant that just opened in California. Uh, I think it's the largest solar installation in the world. And uh, this slide shows some of the habitat that was destroyed for this place. Uh, it's habitat for the threatened desert tortoise. The solar company had to get a special permit to go in and bulldoze this area. And the reports say that it's likely they killed uh, 3,000 or more of these threatened desert tortoises. Most of them they didn't even know because they probably just rolled them over with a bulldozer and they were killed. That's just the destruction caused by the installation, of course. So solar panel production is now among the leading sources of hexafluoroethane, nitrogen trifluoride, and sulfur hexafluoride, three extremely potent greenhouse gases which are used for cleaning plasma production equipment. As a greenhouse gas, hexafluoroethane is 12,000 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. Uh, it's 100% manufactured by humans, and it survives 10,000 years once released in, into the atmosphere. Nitrogen trifluoride is 17,000 times more powerful than carbon dioxide, and sulfur hexafluoride is 25,000 times more powerful, the most powerful known greenhouse gas. And just as an example, nitrogen trifluoride is rising at 11% per year, the atmospheric concentration. So, what about the other end of the process? What happens when these panels and these wind turbines and this green technology is, it breaks or it's done, it can't, doesn't work anymore? This is e-waste. The Silicon Valley Toxics Coalition released a report saying, I quote, as the solar industry expands, little attention is being paid to the potential environmental and health costs of that rapid expansion. The most widely used solar PV panels have the potential to create a huge new source of electronic waste at the end of their useful lives. New solar PV technologies are increasing efficiency and lowering costs, but many of these use extremely toxic materials or materials with unknown health and environmental risks, including new nanomaterials and processes. It's really interesting how you see environmentalists really worried about these new technologies and these GMO crops and such. But when it comes to basically applying the same technologies to solar panels and green energy, you know, they're cheering along. 
So, <coughs> my message is that we have been lied to. And we are the victims of an extremely sophisticated public relations and advertising campaign that stretches from General Electric to the Department of Energy, to the White House, to the UN, to the Sierra Club, to Apple, to Greenpeace, and beyond. And that brings us back to where we started with this wind turbine from General Electric. I'm sure you've all heard this term greenwashing before. This is General Electric's corporate structure. How did we ever think that a technology promoted by a company like this, a $700 billion corporation that is involved in everything from weapons production to nuclear power, a company with a dismal environmental record and a history of leaving behind Superfund sites for the public to pay to clean up or to never get cleaned up at all, more likely. How could we ever think that this business would act in our best interest, in the best interest of the earth? The lie that we have been told hinges on this one big hope. It's the hope that we can maintain the American dream while we save the planet at the same time. It's the hope that we won't have to give anything up. It's the hope that our lifestyle can continue without being threatened by little distractions like killing the planet. And it's been bought into by the middle class, anxious to maintain the comforts and elegancies of modern life. It's also been bought into by many of the poor who've been told this story that the green energy revolution will also mean a revolution in living standards and a revitalization of community. In response to that, I like this quote. The most efficient way of rendering the poor harmless. Meanwhile, General Electric is walking away with a new $10 billion contract. They know it's not going to change the world. What it will change is their bottom line. Businesses exist to make profit, not to make the world a better place. And at this point, most governments around the world simply serve as their corporate proxies in this never-ending revolving door, from lobbyist to consultant to politician and back again, all with a hefty salary, comfortable retirement package, and a nice set of bonuses. I'm more interested in this. And this. If we truly want a livable planet, we're going to have to stop listening to these deceivers. We're going to have to break the spell that's been cast on us. That's going to be hard, because we're not only fighting those in power, but we're also fighting their proxies, their pawns. These people have been so deeply internalized into this longing for a green, a green technotopia that they can't see the contradictions inherent in that. We're also going to have to start thinking for ourselves and confronting the systems of power that are destroying the planet, face to face. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news uh, today, <laughs> but there is no easy way out of this mess. And of course, that's not to say there's nothing to be done. I think there is much that we can do to save the planet, to fight for justice. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a bit here, but I want to pass it off to Cameron for now who's going to take a slightly different angle on the same issue. Thank you, Max. All right, so we've just heard from Max why green energy is not really a solution and it's not really so green. Now, what I want to talk about is how green energy plays into environmental activism. And I hope to convince you that it should have little to no place in our activism. Um, I also want to give you a few ways or ideas to talk about this issue that you can use in your own life, maybe in discussions with other people. Uh, so everything I'm saying should be seen through the lens of activism, because that's what interests me and it's what matters. Um, of course, what matters most is the material effects that these technologies have, which as we've just seen, they're harmful. Uh, they're harmful to the earth, but I think they're also harmful uh, to activism. To environmental activism. So the first danger I see with green energy is the way that it takes the environmental crisis in all of its complexity and it reduces it to an issue of technology only. Um, and I made 
a really remarkable paint rendition of this. Um, so <laughs> that's, uh, that's what it looks like. Now, of course, technology is an issue. I mean, we need different technologies, um, but we need many other things as well. We need new stories, new institutions. We need new relationships with each other and with non-humans. And many of you have experienced this, how environmentalism at its core, it, it leaves no stone unturned. Um, it asks us to re-examine really everything in our lives. So the economic, the social, the spiritual, the psychological. But when the problem is reduced to one of technology only, all of those other questions are blotched out. They're made invisible. And we don't even think to ask them. And a friend of ours wrote something I think is great. He said, often we never question why we need new technologies and resources, and we never think about what problems they purport to solve or conceal entirely. And what green energy conceals is the depth of the problem. It's not only technological, it's stories, it's our language. We can go on and on with this, and we should go on and on with this as part of our work. Uh, but in short, the problem is total but green energy conceals this. And this concealing, we could call it illusion. Green energy, it responds to a, a real problem, a very real problem, but it responds in the wrong way. And in that, it itself becomes part of the problem. So how does this happen? How does this play out? Uh, one of our friends tells a story of a meeting he went to with some other environmentalists. And they were saying, we need to ramp up solar really fast. And he said, have you thought about resource depletion? That there's not even enough silver to build the amount of solar panels that you're talking about. And one of them, who's a pretty well-known organizer, um, they responded, don't worry about that. There's more than enough silver. It's just underneath China. So picture that, right? You have a major environmental organizer advocating large-scale mining to build solar panels. And uh, I've heard some gasps. You see the problem. You cannot destroy the world to save it. Right. And also, this is where green technologies take you. Again, you start out on the, on the right path, environmentalism, but you end up in the wrong place, extraction. And this is why we call it an illusion. Uh, another example as Max was talking about, the Ivanpah solar project. It's the largest solar site in the world. Uh, it's a solar thermal site, meaning that it, uh, all these mirrors, they're all aimed at this water tower. Uh, they concentrate the sun's energy, heats up the tower, the water boils, and then steam you know, generates a turbine. Um, and not only heats up the tower, it also heats up the area surrounding it. So they've found already you know, several dozen birds that have had their wings burned and singed and they've fallen to their death. And you know, there's two ways to respond to that. You could say either, well, this is to save humanity, so what, you know, what are a few birds? Or you, know, you could really open your heart and see that says something about this technology. That, is that who we are? That's not who we are. Then we have someone from Greenpeace saying about this project, the clean energy revolution is not only possible, it's happening now. Take a moment to reflect on this news, America. Our movement is stronger than ever. Okay, this project is owned by three corporations, one of them being Google. So I hope this is not our movement. Okay, so how has this happened? How have environmentalism and green technologies come, uh, come to go hand in hand? Uh, it's hard for people to think about one without thinking about the other. Um, and it's very strange. It seems like it's obvious, but if you think about it, environmentalism at its core, it challenges destruction. And yet green energy continues it. It depends on it. Environmentalism challenges industrialism, but green energy relies on it and continues it. I think there are at least two reasons why these two opposites have come together, and they've been sold in one package. The first is, like any system of power, you know, capitalists and capitalism in general is good at taking any kind of threat, 
uh, taking that energy and turning it to its own uses. I think we've seen how corporations, I mean, the greenwashing, right? We all know that. Um, the second reason, which is more interesting to me, uh, is that green energy offers an easy way out. So if you believe in green energy, you both get to clear your conscience, you can live green, and you get to hold on to the industrial fantasy. Right? You get, you get all the comforts that come along with that. And as Max said, we've been lied to. And we have bought into that lie. And we continue, environmentalists continue to perpetuate that lie. And that's how, in this really creepy sort of way, environmentalists, some, have worsened the problems as well, in terms of maintaining an illusion and not allowing people to see things as they really are. When we talk about green energy, we're talking about more than just green energy. I see green energy so much as loaded into it. I, li I think of it as the last straw of the industrial fantasy. Everything we've been told since birth about our relationship to the natural world, that we live above it and separated from it, for many of us, that story has its last support in green energies. Which is why there's a point at which rational argument reaches its limit, that there's no amount of information you can tell to someone to convince them that green energies are not sustainable. They're going to continue believing it because they have to believe it. Because if they stop believing it, their, very, their whole understanding of this world, the industrial civilized world, that would collapse in on them. And that's a very painful thing to go through, as I'm guessing many of you in this room know. So green energy here, it becomes a kind of defense. It's a lie we tell ourselves to protect ourselves from the truth. The hard truth that this way of life is not sustainable, not here and there, at its core. And we can continue to tell ourselves that lie and protect ourselves from that painful process. But think of everything that we lose, and especially in terms of activism. Uh, there's a really great interview between Terry Tempest Williams and Tim DeChristopher. Tim DeChristopher is the man who bid on all the parcels of land at the auction. He had no intention of paying for them. Um, and he ended up saving over 20,000 acres of land. Um, and she asks him, how did you get to this position where you could do something so creative, so risky? And he goes back he, several years telling a story of how he was at a talk uh, by a major climate scientist. And you know she gave the story that it's, it's it's largely irreversible, there's nothing we can do. Whether that's true or not, that's what she said. He went up to her afterwards to ask her about it. She put her hand on his shoulder and said, I'm sorry my generation has failed yours. And he's telling Terry Tempest Williams, he says, once I realized that there was no hope in any sort of normal future, there's no hope for me to have anything my parents or grandparents would have considered a normal future, I realized that I have absolutely nothing to lose by fighting back. And later on he says, my future was already lost. So this is what interests me. What has to happen to someone that they become an environmentalist? I mean, it's a lot of things, as you all know. It's, it's love, it's relationships with the natural world, with other people. But for a lot of us, it's about having that view of the world, of the industrial world, of oil and everything that goes with it. It's about having that shattered. And there's nothing nice about it. It's painful, it's difficult, but in its place, you find something else. You find stronger relationships, real relationships. You find passion, and you find commitment to something larger than yourself. And that transformation, that's a really amazing thing. It's something that should be protected, and celebrated, and guided, and honored. And what does green energy do? Green energy, as far as I've seen, and I'm guessing many of you have seen this, it works to stunt and head off that transformation. It, it, it domesticates it. It takes all this, this passion, this energy, it takes it and it redirects it back into the very system that I was being challenged. Okay. And it, as I showed, oh, it's gone. As I showed, it makes it a very complex situation. It makes it into a false choice. It's either we have fossil fuels or green energy. 
right? And that's, that's not true. And we need to break out of that. And when we break out of that, uh, then we can find something new. We can make something new and put that into practice. Um, so that's our challenge, is how can we think and practice an environmentalism that doesn't rely on green energy? Now, some people here might say, uh, okay, of course it's not perfect, but isn't it better than the alternative, better than fossil fuels? Uh, and that still seems wrong to me. I think modern environmentalism has almost always relied on a strategy of moderation. It has said, let's find something less bad, let's find something less destructive. But there comes a point where we have to say, where you have to decide, do I only want to slow destruction or do I want to stop it? And it's in making that choice, making that stand, and deciding, I, we, we are not going to allow this. That's what a movement depends on. And it's, I think, what life on this planet depends on. So I'm going to pass it back to Max and give him the very difficult section of what needs to be done. OK. Thanks, Cameron. That's just a nice picture of a bird that Cameron put in there that you forgot to flip to. So, uh, I completely agree with that assessment. Uh, and that is exactly the important question. Do we want to just slow down the destruction, or do we want to stop it? And uh, here's a headline from one of the most uh, well-respected newspapers in the world on that subject. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's one of my favorite headlines I've ever read. It's, it's, it's amazing how sometimes the fake news is so much more true than the real news. You know? Oh, I'm sorry. It, it's a headline from The Onion. That's why we're laughing. It says, millions of barrels of oil safely reach port in major environmental catastrophe. So can't, what Cameron said is right. We, We've gotten too comfortable in this mindset of finding a less harmful alternative. Uh, and honestly, when you're starting from this god-awful baseline, it's pretty darn easy to find something that's slightly better. Uh, and usually that still means destruction for the planet. So if there's one thing we want you to walk away from this talk with, it's that green technology is not a solution. And it, it reminds me of a quote from Malcolm X. And People like to quote these historical figures without really knowing history very well, and so I just want to say that I think it's really important to understand history and to understand these figures, and Malcolm X had a lot of various issues, including misogyny and other things, but he was really smart in some ways. And I love this quote. He said, if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, there's no progress. If you pull it out all the way, that's not progress. Progress is healing the wound that the blow made. I think that's exactly what we're seeing with this green technology. So this is sort of a summary of what we've been talking about here. On the left, we've got fossil fuels. On the right, we've got green technologies. So in terms of extraction, fossil fuels require large-scale, unsustainable extraction of metals and other resources. On the right, green technologies requires large-scale, unsustainable extraction of metals and other resources. <coughs> Just the same. In terms of production, fossil fuels, globalized industrial production process requiring energy intensive technologies. On the right, under green technology, globalized industrial production process requiring energy intensive technologies. Pollution, fossil fuels, extreme pollution released from initial exploration through extraction and consumption. Pollution is often visible at the site of consumption. In terms of green technology, is a little bit different here. Extreme pollution released from initial exploration through extraction and disposal. Pollution often invisible at site of consumption. In terms of human rights, fossil fuels contribute to resource conflicts, exploitation of labor, and human rights violations worldwide. On the right, green technology, exactly the same, contributes to resource conflicts, exploitation of labor, and human rights violations. In terms of democracy, fossil fuels, the technology is largely controlled by multinational corporations, they require massive capital to get started. Community scale implementation is largely impossible. On the right, exactly the same for green technologies. 
So these are just a few of the ways in which these are exactly the same. So I, need, I think we need to start, start talking about stopping destruction. We need to start talking about winning. And I don't think people talk about winning very much. We've gotten so used to uh, sort of being in this running retreat that, that people fighting for justice have been in for so long. So what's to be done? What's the solution if we can't count on green technology to save us? Uh, there are a lot of people out there talking about solutions and uh, a lot of approaches, a lot of people doing good work, but let's just look at a few. First up, we've got the eco-socialists. They have a really great analysis of capitalism and labor. Um, they're doing some really wonderful work. I'm from Seattle where they're doing some great stuff getting into the political system, trying to, uh, trying to raise the minimum wage to something halfway livable. Uh, but their program is generally seems to be based on the idea that industrial production should continue. Uh, and as we've seen, industrial production is, is just a nightmare for the planet. Uh, we've seen this in many socialist countries as well. Uh, for example, Bolivia, where um, left-wing Evo Morales came into power uh, through a coalition of the indigenous communities and the Marxists and the other left-wingers. And uh, once he got into power, there, there were huge conflicts because all the Marxists and the socialists wanted, they were pro-industrialism. They wanted to go in and get oil and gas from the rainforest. And the indigenous people were opposed to this. Um, some people might say this isn't true eco-socialism. Uh, that's sort of up to you to debate. But um, I do want to say that as I go through these models of change, I have a lot of respect for a lot of people doing, doing this work. So uh, I think this is meant as a friendly disagreement. Uh, so next up, we've got permaculture. Uh, there's a lot of good to be said for this method. I know there are a few people in this audience who are friends of mine who are really involved in that. I agree that it's completely critical for resistors to build our own food networks, to build up our alternative institutions, so that we're not completely reliant on industrial <coughs> civilization to eat and house ourselves, clothe ourselves, keep ourselves healthy, etc. cetera. Uh, it's the only way we're going to survive as this culture continues uh, this sort of headlong rush towards collapse. But the problem is that permaculture isn't stopping any pipelines or strip mines, uh, at least not by itself. And so I think it's, it's, it's part of the solution, but it's not enough. Then we've got the mainstream environmental movement, uh, which seems to be focused on reaching out to as broad a community as possible. And as we all know, that's code for reaching out to white middle class people. Right? Uh, these are the groups largely that are advocating for 100% renewable energy. Uh, and they've gotten so caught up in this idea that climate change is the issue, the one issue, that sometimes it seems like they've forgotten about nature and the natural world, right? Uh, I'm not saying there, there aren't mainstream environmental groups that do great work, because of course there are. And there are a lot of good people involved in these organizations. Um, one of my favorites is Center for Biological Diversity, for example. They sue the crap out of all kinds of places to protect species. It's great. Uh, but these groups are operating within a very strict set of boundaries, which make it possible for them to have small victories here and there, but never to make very much progress. So next up, we've got radical environmentalists and land defenders. There's some really great work going on here. Uh, this slide is from the <coughs> Unistoden camp, which is in Canada, uh, north of the border, way up, uh, how far is the drive past Vancouver? Like 16 hours or something past Vancouver, way up in central BC, out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and the Unistoten clan of the Wet'suwet'en First Nation has set up a, uh, a camp. They've reclaimed some of their traditional lands that they never ceded in a treaty. They still have legal title to this land. And they've set up a camp in the path of a pipeline corridor. Uh, the, the oil and gas companies want to put in eight or nine pipelines to carry tar sands oil and fracked natural gas um, from the interior out to the coast for export. And they, uh, they moved back onto their traditional territory. They built cabins. They built permaculture gardens. They hunt out there. And they've set up a sort of uh, soft blockade across the road where they refuse to allow in 
anyone from these oil and gas companies, but they do allow you in if you're just coming out to hunt or fish or um, go camping or something like that. Uh, this, for those who can't see, this is a picture of them building a traditional pit house. So this is their traditional construction technique. Um, they blacken the, the, uh, the timber to prevent it, prevent uh, insects from eating it and it rotting. And I think Sam was there helping build this last summer. Yeah. Or in the spring. Spring. So uh, these people are really brave and are doing some wonderful, amazing work. And effective as well. I mean, we're talking about a small community of people stopping, uh, you know, a continental scale extraction project. So I think uh, this is the sort of way we need to be thinking strategically, looking for these bottlenecks where uh, a small number of people can make a really big difference. Uh, I have a lot of hope for the radical environmental movement. Um, we're seeing a lot of serious civil disobedience like this uh, all over the all over the place, but we're also seeing the difficulties of this approach. Um, in Texas, for example, we all know about the tar sands blockade and the amazing series of, of uh, lockdowns and tree sits and such that they did uh, a year ago or two years ago now. And they, they really shut down the construction of that pipeline for quite a while, but that pipeline's in now. It's, it's in the ground. It's completed. And so they, they lost, despite all that energy and effort. Um, and of course, they have to deal with the huge legal bill now and all the consequences of that. So there are repercussions in terms of the material reality of organizing. Uh, in Michigan, we see, it, we see it too. Just recently, those three women were sentenced to all that jail time for their civil disobedience. And this, uh, you expect this in nonviolence, of course. That's how it works. You, know? you do nonviolence, and they crack down on you. And uh, so in order for it to work, you need to have numbers. You need to be able to sustain this. You need to have the resources and the number of people to keep doing this again and again, to build momentum, to bring more people into the movement until you have eventual success. Um, I'm not, I don't know if we have those numbers. This is, that's the first tar sands mine in the US. Uh, that's in Utah, it's a couple hours from where I live. Um, I've been organizing with some local folks. This is a little road blockade we did. But we've been trying to stop this mine. And it is a project that I think we might be able, I think there's a chance that we could stop it uh, using above ground nonviolent tactics, you know, traditional nonviolence. Um, but the problem for me is that, you know, we're, this, this mine is in an area that's the largest oil producing region in Utah. There's uh, I think something like 22,000 oil and fracking wells in the basin that this mine is in. And those are already producing. This mine isn't even producing yet. And it's taking the entire uh, energy of the activist community in Utah and surrounding states, plus people coming in from outside. Tons of money, tons of funds, tons of time. Um, and we have a small chance of stopping the expansion of one project in an area that's already producing huge amounts of oil. And we, have, we can't even begin to think about trying to stop that fracking in that oil because we're just, we have a lot to deal with. So I don't think that hoping for the future is enough. I'm not content to just rely on hope. So this map shows major fossil fuel expansions that are planned or ongoing right now uh, up to the year 2020. So we've got giant projects like coal mining in Indonesia and Australia, um, as well as Western China. We've got oil extraction in Kazakhstan, the Caspian Sea, uh, Central Africa. We've got offshore drilling in Brazil and the Gulf of Mexico, the Arctic, etc. So I think that if we had the numbers and the resources, we could fight and stop all these projects using nonviolence. It's completely possible. Uh, I have nothing but respect for anyone who I see who's organizing in that way. But I honestly don't see the numbers. Um, like I said, we can barely uh, have a chance at winning in this one small project in, in Utah, and it's not even big enough to be listed on this map. Uh, so I don't know if, if we have the numbers. 
And then, of course, I think about the fact that 200 species went extinct today. And then I think again, 200 species went extinct today. <coughs> and then I just repeat that in my head because I can't wrap my mind around that and what that means. You know, 200, 200 entire species. So the only strategy that I see that could work is somewhat radical and direct. And what I'm talking about here is direct attacks on industrial infrastructure. This probably sounds extreme to some of you, and for good reason. But you should realize that sabotage is a time-tested and honorable method of political resistance. This is what Mandela said when he was on trial in South Africa. I do not deny that I planned sabotage. I did not plan it in a spirit of recklessness nor because I have any love of violence. I planned it as a re result of a calm and sober assessment of the political situation that had arisen after many years of tyranny, exploitation, and oppression of my people by the whites. So I work with an organization called Deep Green Resistance, and we actually have a strategy that lays out how small groups of organized and committed people could bring down the entire global industrial economy. And the way they could do it is by targeting critical structural nodes. That's an important term to understand. When I say critical structural nodes, I'm talking about the physical systems that allow the industrial economy to continue to function. Things like fossil fuel infrastructure, communication systems, electrical systems, uh, refining distribution, uh, global finance, transportation, etc. So uh, this is not a game. And it's not a position that I take lightly. I take it not in the spirit of recklessness, nor because I have any love of violence. I take it because of a calm and sober assessment of the political situation that we face after decades of fighting a running retreat that sometimes looks more like a rout. <coughs> As a resistance movement, we have to start thinking strategically and tactically. What are our goals? We need a livable planet, clean air, clean food, clean water. That's the baseline. In order to have that, we need to stop industrial logging, industrial fishing, industrial mining, food production, industrial food production, <laughs> dams, coal power plants, pipelines, refineries, the fossil fuel economy, the global economy as a whole. This is our only chance at survival. The good thing is that there are a lot of good books about that out there to teach the basic lessons of strategy and tactics, organization, security procedures, and that go over the history of resistance movements and how they've worked in the past. So we don't have to figure all this stuff out from scratch. It's been done before. So when I say that we want to bring down industrial civilization, that sounds like a huge job. There's no denying that this is a massive system. Strategic sabotage is effective, however. This can be done. It's been used in hundreds of historical conflicts because it works. And when I've presented this strategy to ex-Special Forces members uh, who have trained in this sort of thing, they basically say, yeah, the strategy is sound. This could work. This is a strategy that could actually win. And there have been a few rumblings lately that something might be brewing um, that are sort of exciting to me. So last spring in central California, a transmission substation that feeds power to Silicon Valley was attacked in a military-style raid, quote unquote, by unknown persons. Uh, so the, the people who did this, they, they found an underground fiber optic cable. They, uh, pulled up the manhole cover, they went in there and they cut that to disable phone access and cell phones in the area. And then they fired 120 rounds from a hunting rifle into the substation, which shut it down completely and it took a month to repair it. Uh, so this has been called the most sophisticated attack on the grid in U.S. history, which on the one hand makes me very happy and I'm glad about that, and on the other hand I'm like, really? This is the most sophisticated attack? You have found anything better than like a hunting rifle? <laughs> Uh, one, one electrical worker stated that the grid is highly vulnerable to these sort of strikes. And some politicians and military officials 
have stated that, quote, this looked like a trial room. Someone was testing the waters. So this is very heartening to me. Another heartening group comes from this area. That's in the Niger River Delta, and it's an area that uh, Royal Dutch Shell has been taking oil from for more than 50 years. And so they poison the air, the land, the water. Uh, the people are starving because there are no fish anymore. The crops won't grow because of the acid rain from all the natural gas that they flare off. Uh, so there was a nonviolent resistance here for decades. Uh, it was led by the famous poet Ken Saroliwa, um, you know, widely respected as a human rights ad advocate, an environmental advocate. Um, and after years of, of agitating in the community and protests, uh, he and the other leaders of the resistance were rounded up by Shell and the military uh, that they work with, and they were hung. Uh, that was assisted by Shell's private, private military force, um, of which oil companies have, and also those, those mining companies that get the iron ore and the, uh, the rare earth minerals and the copper, they also have their private military forces. So the latest generation of resistance in the Niger River Delta is men. It's the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta. And uh, they use direct attacks on infrastructure. So here's an example of people using this strategy. They've managed to knock out one third of the fossil fuel industry. So I just want us to think about that because the number is abstract. But think about all the environmentalism that has been done in this country. You know, all the thousands of people at this conference. We haven't even managed to slow the growth of fossil fuel emissions, let alone knock out 30% of it. And here we're talking about a few hundred people, a small group, highly trained individuals, focused with goals, with strategy, with good target selection, knocking out one third of the oil production in a matter of a few years. So I think we could learn some lessons there. So, I'm sure there are people in the audience who don't agree with this because it's very, it's radical. I understand that. Um, I think it's necessary, and I think our backs are against the wall. So I think this is, you know, this is a backup plan that we need because nothing else is working. But even if you don't agree, I think there's a lot that can be done. This is from the DGR book. It's a chart that's in there, and uh, this is just sort of a selection of different levers that people can apply their weight to to try and change the world. Um, but you know, even if you uh, really love your electricity and you want to keep industrial civilization around and just sort of ignore the mountaintop removal mining that that takes and the slavery that that takes, um, I think you have to understand that this culture is not sustainable. You know? We're drawing down every resource, and this culture will not last. So we, we might see the end of this way of life in a generation. Who knows? So if you're concerned about collapse, and if you're concerned about human rights, and if you don't want to uh, think about these more militant strategies, then I think you need to be doing the work of worrying about human rights, and building local food systems in your community, and building alternatives to this system that, as we can see, it's undeniable that it's killing the planet. So I think there are many ways that this can be addressed. And if your personal morality doesn't want you to be involved in anything that is more militant, then this is a way that you can contribute. So I, I really think we need all that. So I've heard that in Los Angeles, when the power goes out, the police stations start getting phone calls, um, panicked phone calls from people who've never seen the stars before. And they're not sure what, what they're seeing up in the sky. Um, so that's not the way it's always been, obviously. Um, we're animals just like all the other animals around. And I think our natural state is to live in balance on this planet, in embedded communities, uh, embedded in the land, living uh, with all the other life forms around us. Um, there's just so much evidence that this is the natural state of human beings. And uh, all you have to do is look at land-based cultures around the world, and, and you'll have the evidence that you need this is the same from the people in Malaysia. It says the, the land is sacred, 
It belongs to the countless numbers who are dead, the few who are living, and the multitudes of those yet to be born. So, it's hard to imagine life without the modern luxuries um, that we're used to, the, the heated room, the lights, um, and sometimes it's even harder to imagine life without the exploitation that is required for these things. Uh, as I said earlier, I live in Salt Lake City, and uh, the winters are very cold there. Uh, it's below freezing for a month or two months on end. And uh, it's tough to imagine living without civilization there. It would be a hard place to live. Um, but then I remember that half the world's population lives without electricity. And the more I think about it, the more I realize that it can be done. We don't have to live in this modern industrial way. Um, I have friends who live in homes that they built out of natural materials. Um, one good friend of mine raises uh, goats and chickens. That's uh, that's her. That's some baby goats of hers with the guard dog, who's just very noble looking in that picture. And uh, great dog. Uh, I know people who cook with, with wood alone. Um, this woman preserves her harvest and uh, lives off the land almost year round. Another friend of mine is a member of the Yuli Shoshone and uh, he hunts uh, turkeys, deer, and elk with a bow and arrow. Um, another friend of mine keeps alive the herbal medicine traditions of her community that have been passed down for generations. Um, it's even in my own family. One of, one of my aunts weaves beautiful baskets from cedar bark uh, and cattails and other materials like this. Um, my, another aunt of mine and my mother are both potters, you know, that's a tradition that's 30,000 years old and uh, sort of a fundamental human, human skill of survival. Um, so I think that if we're willing to live in balance, Earth will provide what we need. Earth will provide for an abundant, beautiful life. And these sort of skills like basket weaving, herbal medicine, um, fire making, these these, in a way, are technologies. They're not, they're not like these green industrial technologies that we've been talking about, but they're very complex technologies, which I'm sure if you've taken a pottery class or a basket weaving class, you know, um, you know these are complex, right? They're not simple. Uh, and they've been passed down from generation to generation. And the reason that they've lasted for so long is because they're functional. They work, you know, they work in the long term. And, um, they don't require the world to be killed. So, those are some baskets my aunt made. Um, so the same techniques that she uses here can be used to produce clothing, backpacks, bedding, storage baskets, hats, rain jackets, waterproof baskets, uh, um, all sorts of other things. I, I can't even, that's probably like less than 10% the things that I could remember if I sat down for a while. <laughs> but there's some amazing uh, there's some amazing stuff out there about the basketry traditions of the Pacific Northwest, which is where my aunt lives. Um, and incidentally, I mean, I was pretty shocked to learn this, but these waterproof baskets, you, you can cook in them by uh, heating rocks in a fire, and then you put the rocks in the water in the waterproof basket, and it doesn't burn through the bottom through some mystery. <laughs> uh, and you can boil water and cook food in there, and you don't have to destroy a mountain to do so. So, uh, I don't think that this sort of more simple life is nasty, brutish, and short, as we have been led to believe. Uh, I, I want you all to try to, if you can, imagine living life in this sort of way. Imagine living life nestled inside a, a forest or a grassland or a wetland. Um, imagine life with no clocks, you know, no cancer epidemic, uh, no wage slavery, no drones, um, and global warming, just some fading myth of the culture as, as the land soaks up all that toxic air. Um, I think this life is, is not only possible, I think it's our only real option. And I think it's really just right around the corner. 
So I, I don't mean to glamorize the situation too much because we've dug ourselves into a deep hole, or more accurately, uh, others have dug a deep hole and we're in it. Um, modern medicine is pretty amazing in some situations, you know, but um, when the choice is the end of the world or the end of some of the things that, 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 uh, that we like and rely on, in this modern civilization, and I think that's a, it's an easy choice. It's a hard choice in many ways, but it's an easy choice in the end. So, I think life without gas heating would be really hard in Salt Lake, but it would be life. And that's more than can be said for modern civilization. Uh, because the inevitable conclusion of civilization is barren fields, Saline soils, silent clear cuts, enslaved and conquered peoples. So the question is, which side are you on? And do you want something different? So we, we started this talk on the subject of green energy, and uh, we ended it by talking about bringing down industrial civilization. So we've come a long way. But uh, I don't think we made any huge logical jumps there. I think that it just goes to show that all these issues are highly interconnected. If you really start digging, it spider webs out, and it's really hard to look at these things. You know, we're used, we're taught to look at green energy in this, this, uh, this very linear, siloed way, where we just look at the point of consumption only, and we say, oh, this is sustainable, this is good, this is just, this is right. So it, that's the main. You know, this this was a talk about green energy, so that's the main point that I want y'all to take take home, is that. We, we have been sold this lie, and I, I think we need to stop believing what we've been told about green technology. Uh, I think at that point, at this point, I think that's our only chance. So um, that's it.